Open market operations are used by the Fed to increase or decrease the commercial bank reserves available, which in turn will affect the amount of money available in the economy. As part of their open market operations, the Fed will buy or sell government bonds. If they purchase the bonds from the commercial banks, the commercial banks are in effect transferring part of their holding of securities to the Fed, which creates new reserves for the banks and their accounts at the Fed. By increasing the commercial bank's reserves, the Fed has increased their lending capacity. If the Fed sells government bonds to commercial banks, the opposite effect occurs. The banks lose reserves, which will reduce their lending capacity. When the Fed buys government bonds from commercial banks, it increases the assets of the Fed and increases the reserves of commercial banks. This will increase the lending ability of the commercial banks. These excess reserves are also subject to the monetary multiplier. When the Fed buys government bonds from the public, the effect is much the same. The assets of the Fed increase, and as the public deposits the funds into commercial bank, its reserves and lending ability will increase. Note, however, that the increase in the money supply will not be as significant due to the fact that individuals' checkable deposits will be subject to the required reserve ratio. In addition to open market operations, the Fed has three other tools available. The Fed can change the reserve ratio, which will affect the ability of commercial banks to lend. If the reserve ratio is increased, the money multiplier will decrease, and vice versa. This table shows that a change in the reserve ratio affects the money-creating ability of the banking system as a whole in two ways. First, by changing the amount of excess reserves, and second, changing the size of the monetary multiplier. The open market operations are the most important tool in the Fed's arsenal. It gives the Fed great flexibility in controlling the money supply, and the impact on the money supply is swift. The other tools are typically only used in special circumstances. For example, the last change in the reserve ratio came in 1992, and was done more to shore up banks and thrifts in the aftermath of the 1990-91 recession than to impact the money supply. As the lender of last resort, the Fed makes short-term loans to banks to cover unexpected and immediate needs for additional funds. The rate that the Fed charges the banks is called the discount rate. In providing the loan, the Fed increases the reserves of the borrowing bank. Since there are no required reserves against loans from the Fed, all new reserves are considered excess reserves, and as such, they enhance the ability of the bank to lend. If the Fed raises the discount rate, it discourages banks from borrowing, and if it lowers the rate, it encourages banks to borrow. Before borrowing from the Fed, banks will often seek out loans from other banks that have excess reserves not being used. And instead of leaving excess reserves at the Federal Reserve Banks, which typically pay less interest than commercial banks, when banks have excess reserves, they prefer to loan them to other banks that temporarily need the money to meet their own reserve requirements. The rate charged by the commercial bank on these overnight loans is referred to as the federal funds rate. It serves as the equilibrium rate for this market of bank reserves. The Federal Reserve targets this rate by manipulating the supply of reserves that are offered in the market. Typically, this is done by buying or selling government bonds. The FOMC meets regularly to choose a desired federal funds rate and then directs the Federal Reserve Bank of New York to undertake the open market operations needed to achieve that rate. In this example, we're assuming that the Fed desires a 4% interest rate. The demand curve is downward sloping because lower interest rates give banks greater incentives to borrow. The supply curve for the federal funds is horizontal at the desired rate because the Fed uses open market operations to manipulate the supply to keep it there. The term auction facility is another way that the Fed can alter bank reserves. Twice a month, the Fed auctions off the right for banks to borrow reserves for 28 and 84 day periods. This tool allows the Fed to guarantee that the amount of reserves it wishes to lend will be borrowed and therefore will be available as excess reserves in the banking system to increase lending. 
During times of recession and unemployment, as in the past few years, the Fed will initiate expansionary monetary policy. The idea is to increase the supply of money in the economy in order to increase borrowing and spending. One of the problems with the recovery today is that while spending has increased some, borrowing is actually down. It seems ironic that when people save instead of borrow, it can actually be detrimental to the economy. If the Fed feels the economy is overheating or heading into a period of inflation, it will switch to restrictive monetary policy. This policy involves increasing the interest rate to reduce borrowing and spending, which should curtail the expansion of aggregate demand and keep prices down. During times of rising inflation, the Fed will switch to a more restrictive monetary policy. In order to keep prices down, the Fed will increase the interest rate in order to reduce borrowing and spending, which will hopefully slow the expansion of aggregate demand that is driving up the price levels. The Taylor Rule was developed by economist John Taylor and builds upon the theory that most economists have, which is that central banks are willing to tolerate a small positive inflation rate if doing so helps the economy achieve its potential output. The Taylor Rule assumes that the Fed has a 2% target inflation rate and follows three basic rules when setting its target for the federal funds rate. 1. When real GDP equals potential GDP and inflation is at the target rate of 2%, the federal funds rate should be at 4%. 2. For each 1% increase of real GDP above potential GDP, the Fed should raise the federal funds rate by half a percent. And 3. For each 1% increase in the inflation rate above the 2% target rate, the Fed should raise the real federal funds rate by half a percent. Monetary policy sets off a chain reaction that affects the economy's levels of investment, aggregate demand, real GDP, and prices. It is much quicker in addressing issues than fiscal policy, but still depends on private businesses and individuals to make voluntary adjustments to the lending and buying practices. The next slides will illustrate the intended effects of monetary policy. An expansionary monetary policy that shifts the money supply curve rightward in A lowers the interest rate from 10% to 8% which results in the investment spending in B to increase from 15 to $20 billion and causes aggregate demand to increase. This shifts the aggregate demand curve rightward from AD1 to AD2 in C so that real output rises to the full employment level QF along the horizontal dashed line. Conversely, a restrictive monetary policy will cause the money supply curve to shift leftward thereby increasing the interest rate, decreasing investment, and aggregate demand. This chain illustrates the causes and effects of expansionary monetary policy. When faced with the problems of unemployment and recession, the Fed takes actions to increase the money supply, which should eventually lead to real GDP rising. Unfortunately, it is not an immediate reaction, so the Fed may overshoot the mark, which can lead to high inflation. In times of inflation, the Fed practices restrictive monetary policy and decreases the supply of money, which should lead to a decrease in the inflation rate. However, because pr prices tend to be inflexible, if the Fed's not careful, their actions can lead to a recession. Compared to fiscal policy, which involved the government changing its taxing and spending policies, monetary policy has several advantages. It can quickly be changed to fit the current economic conditions, and because the member of the Fed's Board of Governors served fixed terms and are appointed, not elected, they're not subject to the political pressures that Congress is under. Given the fact that the recession was declared to have officially ended in June of 2009, many economists will continue to debate whether the Fed's actions helped or hindered the recovery. Over the past decade, the Fed has acted quickly to attempt to stimulate the economy, even lowering the federal funds rate to almost zero. The lags complicate monetary policy because although its impact is faster than fiscal policy, there is still a three to six month delay that can cause problems and end up with the Fed overshooting its targets. Economists also feel that monetary policy is more effective dealing with slowing expansions and controlling inflations than it is with helping the economy recover from a severe recession. Even though the Fed may create excess reserves during periods of recession, that doesn't mean that the banks will lend the money out. 
This is why the recent recessionary period the U.S. turned more towards the use of fiscal policy to attempt to spend its way out of the recession. Which policies actually succeeded, we'll probably never figure out. This figure illustrates the many concepts we've covered up to this point, and the principles discussed in preceding chapters, and how they relate to one another. On the left-hand side, we have everything that's ever impacted aggregate supply. Remember, the factors of production, land, labor, and capital, both their quantity and their quality, as well as technology, have the largest impacts on aggregate supply as well as fiscal policy and legal institutional environment regulations. On the right side, we have everything that impacts aggregate demand. Notice that it is the expenditure equation for GDP, C plus I plus G plus X minus M.